This lecture will review the very basic concepts that lie behind hypothesis testing and the way that we use it in behavioral science. These concepts should have been covered in 293. The main thing we want to do here is to make sure and establish a common foundation regardless of the instructor or the time in which you had uh, Psych 293. So to start with the very basics, okay, now I'm not going to sit here and go through a bunch of terminology or anything else, but most of you should realize that we're really testing a specific hypothesis when it comes to what we call null hypothesis testing. The first thing that we formulate is what's called a research or alternative hypothesis, H sub A or H sub 1. This is the hypothesis in which you truly believe. This is the one that you want to support, the one that you really expect to find when you're designing your study. So this is typically a hypothesis that suggests there is a difference or there is some sort of effect. There is something interesting going on. Now, once you establish this, then that sets up your mutually exclusive and exhaustive null hypothesis, H sub zero or H naught as we call it sometimes. Now this is the one, statistically speaking, that you're actually testing. Okay, and we've talked about the reason for this in 293. At this point, we're not going to go into a lot of the details of that, but just so that you understand, this null hypothesis is, again, the one that we're setting all of our distributions, all of our statistical tests up, assuming. That is, what we're doing is we're saying, if our null hypothesis were in fact true, then what would the population look like? What distribution of scores, whatever these scores or values may be, would we expect to find? And then what we're going to say is, okay, well then given the data that we do have, do we indeed expect this null hypothesis to be true? In other words, we're saying if the null hypothesis is true, this is what the world should look like, this is the type of data that we should find in our study. And then we can say, well then given the data we did find in our study, was it likely to have come from this distribution? Whatever distribution is stated or expected from the null hypothesis. Now I think an example typically helps to make this more concrete and really understand how the different concepts that we talk about like p-value and alpha and some of these things really come into play. So let's move on to an example now. Think about a very basic situation. You're going to flip a coin. Okay? Now of course everyone knows if you flip a coin you might land on heads and you might land on tails. Okay? And there's a 50% chance of each one of these things happening. Okay, so half the time I flip a coin, it's going to land on heads. Half the time it's going to land on tails. Pretty simple so far. Now imagine that I'm going to flip the coin a second time. Okay, Well, let's imagine for a moment I got a heads on the first flip, and now I'm going to flip it again. Maybe I get another heads. Or, of course, then maybe I get tails. Okay? And what we can think about then is now after two flips, in the first situation I have a heads and then a heads. The second situation, heads then tails. If I would have gotten tails on the first flip, then similarly I'm either going to get a heads or a tails on the second flip. And at this point, after two flips of a fair coin, you can think about there's four possible outcomes. Moving down your screen, those are getting heads and then heads, heads and then tails, tails and then heads, or tails and then tails. Okay. So let's add a third flip in there, and we're just going to repeat the same situation. Okay, of course, I'm either going to get a heads or a tails if I flip it. Imagine I got heads on the first flip, heads on the second flip, and now my third flip could be either a heads or a tails. Okay. And again, regardless of what happened on those first two flips, again, this third flip could be either heads or tails. So now what I have okay, are eight distinct different sets of outcomes that could have occurred after flipping a fair coin three times. If we look at the first situation, I could have gotten heads, and then heads, and then heads again. Now let's think about what we might be interested in here is the number of heads that are occurring after three flips of a fair coin. Well in this situation, what if we got heads, and then heads, and then heads again? In the second situation, we have heads, and then heads, and then tails. And so we can look at, okay, in the first situation, I flipped the total of three heads. And in the second situation, I flipped the total of two heads. And what we can do is to map out what is the set of outcomes in each of these eight possible scenarios and how many heads that I get in each situation. And if we do that, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so to walk through just one more example, okay, let's look at the one that's being highlighted now. This is the sixth possible outcome, okay, the way they're ordered on your screen. In the first flip, I got tails. In the second flip, I got heads. And in the third flip, I got tails again. So if I look at the number of heads in this situation, the number in yellow at the right of your screen, I have achieved one heads outcome in this situation.
Okay, now what this can then become, what we can think about is, okay, well if we have a fair coin, we expect an even number of heads and tails. And what we're seeing here is the number of heads that are being produced when we're flipping this fair coin after, in this situation, three different coin flips. Well, before moving on, what we can think about is how we can display this information. Granted, this combination of letters and numbers on the right of the screen might not be very accessible, very easy to understand. Well, what we can do is to simply plot this information. And if we're going to do that, what we may do is to think about the different number of heads that are occurring and how many times we see that number of occurrences. Well, what do I mean by that? So if you look at the yellow numbers on the right of the screen, what we can do is to think about this as our data. Okay, in one instance, we have a 3, and then a 2, or a 2, or a 1, or a 2 going down the screen. If we plot this in a frequency distribution, where we're plotting the number of heads, 0, 1, 2, or 3, and how many times we see that occurring, then we get this frequency distribution. So if you look down the right side of the screen, you'll see the number 2 shows up three different times. And then if you look on the distribution then, okay, the number of heads 2 okay, has a frequency of 3. Well, another way to display the data that's in a frequency distribution is to think about the relative frequency. Okay? In other words, in terms of all eight of these outcomes, what proportion or probability or relative frequency of those eight outcomes am I seeing for each data point? In other words, for each number of heads. And all that's going to do is to change our frequency axis from the actual numbers, the actual frequencies, the counts that we're seeing, into the relative frequencies. Okay. So in other words, if we look at this, then we see that about 37, 38% of the time, we expect to see two heads come up when we're flipping a fair coin three times. Okay. And about 12 or 13% of the time, which is one out of eight outcomes, we're expecting to see zero heads or three heads show up. Well, how does this help us with hypothesis testing? Okay, let's look at uh, a little more um, complex situation. Okay, think about now what we're going to do is to flip our fair coin not just three times, but ten different times. Okay. Now, how many heads would we expect to find here? In other words, this is going to correspond to our null hypothesis. If you want to set it up and embellish it in some, some sort of context, okay, let's say that, that you're deciding where to go to eat with your roommate. Okay, and I've used this example in the past, so those of you that have had me in the past for 293, this will sound very familiar. And what you're going to do is you flip a coin with your roommate to see who gets to pick where you're going to go to eat. Okay? So the first time you flip it lands on heads, your roommate wins, let's say. Okay? So they get to decide. Okay? The next time, next night, whenever it is, lands on heads again. Well, they get to pick again. And then heads again. And then heads again. And then heads again. And after a while you start to wonder, is this actually a fair coin that we're dealing with here? It is your roommate's coin, they're flipping it every time, and they're getting to pick the restaurant. So your actual hypothesis that you believe in here, your research hypothesis, is that this coin may not be a fair coin. Well, then that makes your null hypothesis that it is indeed a fair coin. So what we need to do if we're going to do hypothesis testing is to set up what would the world look like, what would we expect to find if the null hypothesis was true. In other words, how many heads would we expect to find if it was indeed a fair coin? Well, using the exact same logic that we saw in the previous slide for three flips, we can map that out to ten flips. And all we're going to do is to map out what is each possible set of outcomes we might see when we flip a fair coin ten times. It could be that I land on heads every single one of those times. Could be that I land on tails every single one of those times. Could be that I get heads, then heads, then tails, then heads, then heads, then tails, some combination, okay, that produces a total of, say, three heads, or five, or seven, or eight, or any other number. Well, what we're looking at here is just like we saw in the previous slide, the relative frequency distribution after flipping a fair coin ten times. In other words, we've set up, if the null hypothesis is true, that is, it's a fair coin, what do we expect to find? and this describes the distribution that we would expect to find. Well, we can then determine whether or not any specific number of heads is indeed indicative of coming from the same population, whether or not we think that it's likely that the coin is fair given the number of heads that we find. Another way to think about this is, at what point would you question whether or not the coin is fair? So let's say that there's a total of 10 instances, 
Okay, 10 different days where you're going out to eat with your roommate. Every single one of those times, the coin comes up heads the first time, the second time, the third, fourth, fifth, and so on, and you end up getting a total of 10 heads out of 10 flips. Do you think that you would start to question at this point that the coin is fair? Probably, and in fact, you'd probably be right to do so, because the probability of getting 10 heads out of 10 flips is only about 1 in a 1,000. So chances are either your roommate's very, very lucky, or else there's something going on here. Now, what we're doing here is intuitively doing hypothesis testing. We know that what we expect to find, the most likely outcome, is to get five heads when you're flipping it ten times. Because chances are, because half the time you're going to get heads, half the time you're going to get tails, if you flip it ten times, half of those should be heads. And indeed, that's what we see on our frequency distribution here. It peaks at a value of five. And in fact, almost one quarter of the time, or 25% of the time, we're going to find that we get five heads. That might not be five heads in a row. That might not alternate evenly heads, then tails, then heads, then tails. But after a total of 10 flips, we're going to be most likely to see five heads occurring. It's going to be very unlikely, however, to see 10 heads occurring. It's also going to be very unlikely to see nine heads occurring. The probability of that is only about one in 100. So if instead of 10 heads coming up, 9 heads had come up instead, you'd still probably say, this probably isn't a fair coin. Or, again, your roommate might be just very, very lucky. Well, the question is then, at what point are we going to say, okay, I guess, even though I'm seeing more than 5 heads coming up, even though more heads are coming up than the single number I would expect, it's not that unlikely. What if 6 heads had come up instead? Okay, well... Even though you don't expect 6 to come up, the most likely situation is 5. Okay? About 20% of the time, when you flip a fair coin 10 times, you're still going to see 6 heads coming up. Okay? So this is a situation where you might say, okay, it's a little bit more than I expected, but I'm not going to call my roommate out. I still think this is probably a fair coin that we're dealing with here. In other words, you don't think that it's too unlikely to have occurred.